You're all very welcome to our Social Care Council's lunchtime seminar series. Um, and as Alison has just told you, this series of seminars is an opportunity to hear and learn about best practice and new developments and current challenges in both social work and social care, hearing from experts who are leading the way in Northern Ireland and also hearing from people from other places who can share their knowledge and wisdom to help improve our practice here. So today we are delighted to welcome Professor Ray Jones. Many of you will know Ray from his current work with us in Northern Ireland in leading the independent review of children's services. And this review will be fundamental to how children and their families will be supported and cared for into the future. And we very much look forward to hearing about those recommendations. But today we are hearing um, Ray talk to us on a different topic or on a wider topic, I suppose. So Ray comes to us with a vast wealth of experience in social work. He is the Professor of Social Work at Kingston University. Most importantly, he is a registered social worker. Recently, Ray was awarded an honorary doctorate in civil law from the University of East Anglia. And he has an extensive career behind him in social work practice. He was the Director of Social Services in Wiltshire, and he has gone on to lead on a number of inquiries and reviews into child and adult deaths. Ray has an illustrious academic profile and an extensive research and publication profile. He is frequently invited to provide media commentary and is regarded as an expert, often providing evidence to government committees. Ray is passionate in his support of the social work profession. He was the first CEO of the Social Care Institute for Excellence, Sky. He has been chair of BASWA, and in 2017, Ray was awarded Social Worker of the Year Award for Outstanding Contribution to Social Work. Today, Ray is going to talk to us about social work and social care, what makes sense in doing it well. And Ray has asked me to encourage you to put your comments and your questions into the chat and hopefully we will get an opportunity for some discussion as part of his presentation. Ray, you are very, very welcome. Thanks for that. And I'm sure the first thought you all have is what's in the background, because that's one of the realities of Zoom, isn't it? Uh, and the background today is my daughter's kitchen, because she has much better internet connection than I have living out in, uh, in Wales. So um, uh, if you see my son-in-law coming in to grab his lunch, uh, that's what will be happening. But I don't think um, that's planned at the moment. Uh, what I want to do is um, three things. Uh, one is to um, talk about the current context for all of us working in social work and social care in Northern Ireland, but to be honest, it's the same across the UK and indeed in some other places as well. Uh, and although my brief in Northern Ireland is about children's social care and children's social work, and uh, my background is in um, uh, social services, working with children and with adults. So uh, uh, if you're uh, primarily working in an adult service, uh, then uh, hopefully you can uh, draw out some of this in terms of it makes sense to you as well. Uh, but uh, a lot of the examples are from children's services because that's my brief in Northern Ireland. But having said that, and one of the things I often say if we were doing this live face to face, how many people are working with children? And then I would be saying, how many people are working with adults? And then I'd be reminding us all that if you're working with children, you're working with adults. And if you're working with adults, you need to be looking at and thinking about children. Uh, so. Uh, we are all in this together. But I want to do three things. One, talk about the current context. One, I want to make a pitch in terms of uh, eight C's, the things beginning with C that I think are really important in doing um, uh, social work and providing social care services as well. And then I want to reflect on resilience. And uh, as Marion was saying, do use the chat function and uh, we'll have a few pauses and see what's coming up on chat. Uh, and by the time we finish at 1.30, hopefully I'll have finished in time for us to have a bit of a conversation as well. We'll see how that goes. Here we go. So the current context. And uh, thinking about what it's like working in social work and social care services today in 2022. 
uh, in Northern Ireland. But as I say, we could be uh, thinking the same about right across the UK because there's similar issues. And they all go back to 2008 in terms of some big step changes that took place in 2008. And I say they've washed right across Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England. And the big two events that I want to remind us about are first of all this one. Do you remember 2008? People queuing outside of Northern Rock, et cetera, to get their money out, the international banking crisis, uh, created, I have to say, by um, uh, bankers who were getting really big bonuses, uh, but were inventing investment uh, uh, formula and uh, uh, schemes. Okay, two big yeah. events in 2008, which have had a major legacy for us. The first one was that international banking crisis. Uh, and I was saying created by uh, uh, bankers who are getting big bonuses. And why has that had a legacy for us? Well, in 2010, uh, there was a change of government uh, and that international banking crisis was um, presented as a rationale uh, to introduce uh, austerity. Uh, and austerity in the sense of being targeted at both public services, but also I have to say at um, poorer people, massive reductions massive cumulative reductions year on year on year in welfare benefits really biting now for um, uh, children families disabled uh, adults including older people and the other uh, major implication of it was some um, big cuts in uh, funding for public services uh, so all public services since uh, 2010 as a consequence of austerity built on the back of the banking crisis uh, have had real difficulties in terms of um, keeping up with the real cost of providing uh, the services that are needed at a time when more help has been needed because more people have been getting into difficulty because of increased poverty. So 2008, big implication for us now, 14 years on in terms of um, uh, what the world is like for us in terms of that context. And the other big event for some of us in 2008, and you'll recognize that uh, picture, which is iconic and went right around the world, uh, was the... Uh, uh, the media story about the killing of um, uh, a little boy aged 17 months old in uh, Haringey in North London. And uh, it's only ever so often that uh, a story of uh, a child being killed uh, gets the attraction, the immediate attention that this story got, but it has implications. It had immediate implication in terms of a step change in terms of what was happening in our children's services. And it's had a legacy in terms of implications because we're still um, uh, moving on uh, from the platform that step change in 2008. What happened was that three people uh, were found guilty of causing or allowing Peter's death. That's baby P, Peter Connolly. Uh, that's uh, Stephen Barker, Tracy Connolly, the mother in the, in the middle, and Jason Owen with the moustache, who's the um, uh, brother of um, uh, Stephen Barker. Stephen Barker was uh, Tracy Connolly's boyfriend. And between them, they were found guilty of causing or allowing Peter's death. But the story was shaped largely by Rebecca Brooks, Rebecca Wade uh, from um, uh, the Sun newspaper, where she was the editor. And I have to say, supported at the time by David Cameron, a personal friend of hers, uh, but who was uh, the leader of the opposition. And the story became targeted, not on uh, those three people who had been found guilty of causing or allowing Peter's death, but on the director of children's services in Hiring Gate comes from Northern Ireland, Sharon Shoesmith. And day after day after day, the Sun newspaper and others ran a campaign targeting social workers and their managers and a community pediatrician, demanding that they be sacked. Headlines such as blood on their hands. Yeah. And uh, the consequence was, having uh, launched a petition demanding the sacking of all the workers, on the 1st of December 2008, Ed Balls, who at that point in time was the Secretary of State for what was called Children's Schools and Families, what would now be called uh, Education in uh, England, uh, dismissed Sharon Shoesmith from her job. And the Baby P story, I wrote a book about it, and was not only about social work, you know, it was about corporate services within the council, about health services, education, police, adult social care. Uh, Tracy Connolly, for example, uh, had a mental health support worker because of her depression uh, and anxiety. There were issues around housing and community and voluntary agencies were involved with the family as well. So it went right across the sector, uh, right across the system in terms of uh, who contributed and were a part of the Baby P story. But it was also a story about the press and how the press um, 
uh, handled the uh, and shaped the baby pea story erroneously. It was about the public and how they responded. It was about the inspectorates and how they came to um, decide that hiring gay, which they rated as a good children's services, suddenly was now to be seen as a poor and bad service. It was about the behaviour of councillors, MPs and ministers who uh, flacked the social workers and demanded their dismissal. And that was 2008. And why do I labour that a little bit? Because there was a step change at that point in time in terms of the numbers of children being removed from families as a consequence of compulsory proceedings in the courts right across Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland and England. And that legacy has continued year on year on year. We have seen more children coming into care, primarily through compulsory court proceedings. We have seen uh, more child protection activity. And indeed, if we go through the sequence, and it's in Northern Ireland, as well as the rest of uh, those other countries, we've had more child protection investigations, a lot more. We've had more initial child protection case conferences. We've had more child protection plans. We've had more care proceedings, and we have more looked after children. And the cumulative impact year on year on year because it's not just a one-off activity. It's been building up and increasing every year since 2008. Really has uh, reset the terms and the territory in which we are now practicing in terms of social work and uh, social care within children's services. Something similar has happened within adult services. If we went back to the early 2000s, adult protection and adult safeguarding was um, hardly something that was uh, on the horizon even. Uh, there might be rare occasions when someone with a learning disability might be seen to be subject to abuse or neglect or exploitation and action will be taken, but we did not have, have an infrastructure for safeguarding for adults back in the early 2000s, indeed in Northern Ireland, and some of that has only been built uh, at this point in time, but in adult services as well as in children's services, the focus has become on risk and risk management as much as on relationships and health. And why? Well, there's more awareness of some of the difficulties that, um, for example, children are having as a consequence of neglect uh, and the uh, implications for their development of chronic neglect over a period of time. There's more awareness of sexual exploitation of um, older young people out in communities. There's more need within families as a consequence of increasing poverty and families living with tremendous stress. And when they get into difficulty, there's less help. And those cuts that have been made uh, in terms of services to assist families when they're getting into difficulty particularly outside of Northern Ireland, I have to say, the rollback of uh, Sure Start. That then generates more demand coming into children's social services, and children's social services have had no matching uh, resource increase, and you could say the same for adult services as well. Consequence is more pressure, more cut corner cutting, trying to cut close work down quickly to take more work on, and still that fear of um, blame imploding on top of you if uh, something awful happens to a child or to an adult that we're working with. And all within the context of increasing deprivation and increasing poverty. And we know particularly in relation to children's services, there are really strong correlations between child protection activity and the rates of looked after children and how that relates to uh, increasing poverty and deprivation. Not just more prevalent, but more intense as well. And it's led to um, us in terms of our practice, in terms of some of our policies, giving more emphasis, emphasis to monitoring and, and the surveillance of families in terms of um, risk monitoring, risk assessment, risk management, uh, and some attention taken away from getting in and being able to beside families in terms of providing help and assistance. So it's reset the scene since 2008 in terms of um, both what we're doing and how we're spending our time, but to some extent what we're being asked to do and how we're viewed as well. But here's my pitch. And I don't think we are where we want to be at the moment. I don't think we are where we need to be at the moment, but we don't have to be here. Uh, and, uh, and the best um, children's social care services, uh, for example, uh, as rated by Ofsted in England and uh, looking at what's happening in Wales and uh, uh, in Scotland, where uh, there are inspectorates rating what's happening, uh, more so than in, than in Northern Ireland at the moment. Uh, some uh, areas are doing much better than others and they're prioritizing providing help, working on relationships, providing continuity and getting into communities and building resilience, not just for um, families and children, but within their own services as well. So that seems to me something that we have to hold on to and we have to harness and try and uh, achieve for ourselves for the future in Northern Ireland and elsewhere. So that's some thoughts for me about the current context. 
So I want to move on from the context, which I do recognize is a difficult context. And as I say, it's certainly not where I think um, we necessarily want to be at the moment. To uh, think about what really does undermine, uh, underline, not undermine, underlie uh, good services that we might provide for children and for families and for disabled adults and for older people as well in terms of adult social care and social work. And my pitch is about um, eight seeds. And I'll tell you a little story about this because again, if we were meeting uh, face to face, uh, we might um, actually try this. Uh, when I've been uh, meeting with colleagues over the last few years, I've done a little exercise. And it is over a period of no more than about 10 minutes to think of all the words beginning with C, or actually as an option, all the words beginning with I, that um, you think uh, might help to characterize really doing social work and providing social care well. So within 10 minutes, how many can you generate? And we do it around. Um, uh, within the jargon cabaret style tables of six to eight people. Uh, and the record in 10 minutes is 84 C's, 84 words beginning with C that characterizes doing uh, uh, social work in this instance with social, social work with children and families as well. Uh, much easier to do it with C's and I's, I tell you, because the I's don't score so highly. But um, uh, thinking of the eight C's that I picked out from what I've been hearing from other people as well. This is what I think we really need to hold on to. And my pitch is, it's not rocket science. We don't want to complicate this too much, but it's really hard to do. So, starting with eight C's. And if you read this, you'll find there's many more C's here than eight, because uh, there's eight points, but loads of C's within them. And the first is about care and concern. We really need to hold on to, and sometimes it's difficult to do this when we're stressed and we're stretched ourselves about um, having a very human response alongside and with people who are in crisis, who may be very distressed, who are immersed in trauma in their lives and in their experience. And it's difficult for us to do that uh, when we're pressurized and stressed ourselves and dashing from place to place, task to task, very task focused maybe. Uh, and it's difficult to do it sometimes also when it's hard to keep ourselves open and thinking about and absorbing the distress and stress of other people day after day after day. So the danger that we close ourselves down, we become uh, less um, uh, responsive and uh, empathetic in terms of understanding what other people are experiencing uh, as a means of just protecting and getting through the day and uh, doing the job for ourselves. But in terms of caring concern, it's not complicated task it's a hard task to do but it's not a complicated task it's about and we know this from all the studies uh, that have been taken undertaken over many many years now in terms of the views of service users uh, about um, what they really look for and what they respect and value in the services that they get and it's something about people being reliable people being willing to be beside them and to listen hard it's about turning up on time returning the phone calls being accessible it's about doing the things that we say we will do, following through uh, in terms of our commitments that we give to people. Uh, so some of this is about basic humanity, but it gets squeezed. It gets squeezed when we are too busy. Second of the eight C's, and indeed there's two more here, so it's going to be more than eight, is about competence and confidence. One of the things I reflect on for myself as a practicing social worker, newly qualified, it took me no exaggeration at all, at least two or three years to build up all the confidence to do all the things that uh, uh, I was having to do as a frontline practitioner. Uh, and in those days, it was a generic role. So I was working with children and families, uh, working with um, young children, child protection, uh, children in care, families in distress, adolescents, but also working through with um, children and adults with disability, learning disability, people with mental health issues, older people, people with physical impairment all the things that we might do within children and adult services now uh, within our communities. But it took me two to three years to build up the confidence to have all the conversations and sometimes confrontational conversations that we needed to have challenging conversations to build up the patter of knocking on the door uh, and um, introducing myself when uh, people may not have wanted me there. Uh, and having the confidence to do that uh, is not something that comes 
immediately to me anyway. It's something that you have to build up over time. So being able to do it and having the confidence to do it takes a bit of time. It took a bit of time for me, and I think we should assume that it takes a bit of time for people now as well. Co-production. There's a lot in co-production, and it goes along with cooperation and communication in a minute as well. Co-production is about actually running along that continuum of not doing things to people, not necessarily even doing people uh, things for people, but doing things with people and helping them to do things by themselves in terms of independence and with in terms of inter interdependence. And co-production means really listening very hard, and we're trying to do this through the review in Northern Ireland, to what the experience of um, children and families uh, is like, both their experience in terms of their life generally, but their experience in terms of the services that they um, may need to uh, tap into. And in terms of doing that, I'm thinking about mental health and drug and alcohol services, uh, learning disability services, things that might um, look as though they're about adults and adult services. Uh, but the reason that um, we need to be thinking about uh, what's happening for adults is that point I was making earlier about that's also about how we care for children. Uh, so uh, co-production, listening really hard and shaping our own thinking and responses in relation to what we're hearing. Co-production in another sense, working with other professionals, uh, working across agencies. Uh, I've said this before, and I'm more than happy to say it again and stand up and recount it on it. In Northern Ireland, we talk a lot about our integrated health and social care systems. To be perfectly honest, when I've been going out around uh, uh, the region and I've scratched the service, I've probably seen less integrated services on the ground, multi-agency, multi-professional services than I might have expected, and maybe than I've seen elsewhere. Uh, so one of the things I think we need to think hard about is in addition to co-production with children and families, how we actually work across professional boundaries uh, and agency boundaries uh, within our services in terms of co-production to make um, our services more joined up and more seamless, but more competent and more skilled because we're drawing on a, on a wider skills mix and competency mix in terms of those services. Cooperation and communication. That really does get squeezed when we're busy. Uh, and when we have um, uh, care management reviews or uh, uh, in England, serious case reviews or whatever, uh, and uh, we see that um, there's not been all the communication that there might have been, there's not been all that um, joint working across um, agencies and professionals. Well, some of that gets squeezed out. It gets squeezed out when we're too busy because it's not the immediate task that we have to do compared to other things that might um, look as though they're more urgent. But um, working well means having professionals across different services and agencies who both have the time, but both have the time, but also the knowledge to work well together. And the bit about knowledge is that um, to communicate well, you have to know who you're communicating with. To cooperate well, you have to know who you're cooperating with. And if we have uh, a lot of um, uh, workers who don't necessarily know each other across the agencies, we work to different boundaries, uh, or there's a a lot of change within the workforce, uh, it's hard to cooperate and communicate because we do not know who we are engaging with. We don't even know who they are or where they are. Community. We need to know not only what's happening for individuals, we need to know what's happening in communities. And there's particular dimensions to this in Northern Ireland, which you will be aware of in terms of both history, but also um, uh, current activities. We need to, know, need to know what's happening within communities. We need to know about networks. We need to know about community strengths and resources, which we can harness to help um, children and families and disabled and older people. And we also know about, need to know about community hindrances and indeed threats. We need to know about the context in which people are living their lives within their communities. And to do that, we have to be close to those communities ourselves. We have to be engaged with those communities, but we have to be aware and viewing what's happening within those communities. And one of the things that sometimes I get a little bit concerned about is if we get remote from those communities in terms of the way we organize ourselves, we lose sight of what's happening, we lose touch with what's happening. We can't take it into our assessments and we can't take it into our case planning uh, and our, how we, uh, both uh, mitigate some of the threats for people and difficulties and hindrances for people in the communities, 
but also how we harness some of those community strengths for people and help them to develop as well. Really big one next, continuity. If we have, and I think it may come up in a minute, maybe it doesn't. If we have two more Cs, loads of churn and change within our services, lack of continuity, then uh, we cannot do the job as well as we need to do it. If we have lots of um, changes of um, a social worker, for example, uh, with a family or with a disabled adult, we do two things. One is we lose the story. Getting that picture, uh, we need to build it up over time. We need to know about people's histories as well as their current circumstances. We need to know about their lives. And if we're coming and going in their, li in, in their lives, and um, to be honest, they've told their story to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe more people already, uh, why should they bother to say it to us? But also, if we're not around long enough to listen to the story and to build up the picture for ourselves, we don't actually get a grip on uh, what's happening for people in their lives. And the other bit about continuity, as well as um, the difficulty if we have a lot of churn and change in building up the picture, understanding the history, uh, is that um, why should people trust us? Why should people seek to engage with us? We're here today and we're gone tomorrow. And then someone else turns up and we start again. And probably actually not just starting again, but getting off on a different tact in terms of and the conversations they're having with us. So one of the things about um, uh, doing the job well is we need to build more continuity. And my impression in Northern Ireland is, is a bit um, bipolar in the sense of on one extreme, I've met a lot of workers, a lot of workers, who have worked in Northern Ireland in the same communities, in the same areas, often where they've grown up and where they have their own families and their extended families, who may have worked there 20, 25, 30 plus years. They know what's happening in their area. They know lots of the families in their area. They know their communities. On the other hand, we know that we have 30 to 40% vacancy levels across children's social care teams at the moment within the healthcare trust across Northern Ireland. Uh, and we have a lot of churn and change in the workforce. A lot of rel relatively inexperienced, like I was, workers coming into the workforce. Uh, a lot of change of experienced workers as well. So we are missing out on that continuity that uh, we desperately need. Critical analysis. Doing the jobs that we do, undertaking the, undertaking the work that we do, requires both emotional intelligence, but it also requires intellectual intelligence. It requires emotional intelligence because we have to be open to the distress, the trauma that other people are experiencing, the crisis that they're working through in their lives, which are sending their head spinning and it's hard to see a way forward and which is a bit overwhelming. And emotional intelligence is us both understanding what it's like for people at that point in time in their lives. But emotional intelligence is also about how we both keep ourselves open to um, accept what's happening in terms of people's lives, but survive that ourselves with the distress that it may create for us as well. And emotional intelligence is also about having that empathetic ability to respond to people when they're really in difficulty and uh, in, in crisis. Intellectual intelligence. That's really important because we have to make the best sense that we can of really complex circumstances which are on the move all the time. People's lives are changing, they're not static. People come in and out of relationships uh, in terms of what's happening for themselves and around them. So we're having to make sense of a really complicated picture, most of which we can't see because we're not a part of people's lives. And even if, we're, well, even if we were, we'd only see it from our own perspective. And we have to make that sense of that incomplete picture, which is on the move and changing all the time in terms of making our best judgments, our assessments about what's happening for people in their lives and 
being beside them to help to see a way forward, or sometimes having to take some responsibility for that ourselves if um, uh, there's dangers and threats for children or disabled adults. And that's a really difficult thing to do. Emotional intelligence, really important. Intellectual intelligence, sometimes I think, doesn't get the attention and the recognition that it requires. Making sense of a really complex world, really complex lives, is a kind of crystal ball that I've never had, which has worked perfectly. Uh, and one of the concerns that I sometimes have about um, uh, the reviews that we undertake after a really serious, horrific uh, event or incident is we never had at that time when we were doing that work, the opportunity just to focus on that one person or that family and to uh, draw in all the information we're now able to draw in. At the time we were having to do the best we could with incomplete information, working with a lot of children, a lot of adults, uh, rather than focusing on one, uh, and make the best judgments that we could. And that requires intellectual capacity. And eight, capacity in cash. That word about capacity again. If we don't have enough time to do the job, if it gets squeezed, then we can't give the work the attention that it needs. It means that um, being able to reflect, being able to actually stand back, be able to keep our heads above the parapet in terms of thinking hard rather than uh, uh, trying to close down our thoughts and our work requires time. And uh, if we were in the room together again, I might be asking at this point in time, is there anybody in the room that doesn't feel a bit busy? And this is the, the, the moment when everybody looks around the room to see if anybody's put their hand up. <laughs> and nobody would be wise or brave enough to do so, but no one would do so usually because everybody is a bit too busy at the moment. So the eight C's from me that we ought to be thinking about, and indeed if you count the C's there, there's more than eight, that care and concern, being human, and giving a human response. Competence and confidence, having the, um, both the skills and the competence to do the job, but also the confidence to do it, sometimes in difficult circumstances. Co-production with children and with adults, but also with colleagues and other agencies as well. Corporate cooperation and communication, especially with other agencies and other services, and uh, needing to know who they are and to have trust in them in terms of um, being able to uh, cooperate and to communicate well. Knowing what's happening in communities, because that's where people live their lives knowing about the strengths and also maybe the weaknesses and the difficulties within communities. Continuity, being around over time to build up the picture, to build up the relationships. Critical analysis, yeah, emotional intelligence, but also intellectual intelligence. And capacity and cash, having enough capacity funded by the cash to do the job we have to do. So, four C's to avoid. Churning chaos. You can follow through on that from what we've just been talking about. Commercialization. Good news. Good news. You have not gone down this road, particularly in children's services in Northern Ireland, in the way I now live in Wales. I'm in Wales at the moment, uh, but I've worked over the border in England. Uh, and the privatization of services there, foster care, children's residential care. Agency um, employment, uh, private employment agencies, there were 20% of children's social workers, maybe 30 to 40% in some areas, are agency social workers coming and going. Big profits being taken out of it, not good. Centralization, when the game gets tough and we have to uh, make some savings, pulling people back from communities into central locations. Uh, might make sense of saving some money on accommodation cost, etc., but it stops us being able to uh, stay close to those communities to find out what's happening there and cuts and curtailing, and pretty obvious really. And we've had now 12 years of year on year cuts in public services funding. We've had 12 years of year on year cumulative impact of cuts in welfare benefits. Not something that uh, was good and not something to be continued. So four C's to avoid. So talked about the current context a bit. We talked about the eight C's for social work services. Marion, let me pause again in case anybody has um, logged in any chat comments. Thank you so much, Ray. So uh, just a couple of comments. Um, 
One from Mandy earlier on, before you got into your eight C's, and I think um, probably uh, answered some of, of the question that she asked. Mandy talked about, you know, that, that what you'd been talking about in the early part of your, your presentation makes so much sense, seeing the pattern of how, how we are, where we are, and the way ahead is one of a return to relationship-based practice and community, and how do we get there? And I, I think you may want to say more, but certainly your your eight C's covered a lot of that. Um, another comment from Bernie Bernie Kelly, who says, "Family by Family is an excellent pilot pilot in Stoke, run by Shared Lives Plus and families supporting families who have or are who are who have been or." are known to the local authority and it's getting some good results. Brilliant. Okay. Should I keep running forward, Maureen? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So now I want to talk about, if it's okay, um, within the context that we've been talking about, within um, thinking about the uh, different C's that uh, might be important in doing the job well, something about resilience. And uh, resilience in the sense of Resilient organizations, resilient teams, and resilient workers. So here's my take on this. I'll tell you where this comes from for me. And uh, I mind earlier was um, reading my obituary before I, uh, before the time arrived, really. Uh, but um, in terms of my previous uh, uh, working life professional experience. But one of the things I did when I was a professor of social work at Kingston University in St. George's, a medical school over at Tooting, I was only employed doing that for half my time. The other half of my time, the government um, in England, and, and some of you will have heard this from me before, because I know we've met through the review process, and I've said this before, but the government in England parachuted me into areas uh, of England where pulling an Ofsted inspection, the inspectorate's inspection, children's social services weren't seen to be doing very well, uh, and in particular child protection. Uh, and I worked in five of those areas, uh, different areas in England. And what I would do is over 18 months to two years, I'd be in each area on each site uh, for two days each month, uh, overseeing what they were doing, uh, questioning sometimes, poking and prodding a little bit sometimes in terms of what they need to be doing, uh, but um, uh, being a part of the process, hopefully being a part of the process of making progress and um, uh, moving out of the um, bit of a pit that they were in at that point in time. Uh, so I did that in five areas of England. Uh, and I also, uh, between 2009 and 2013, 14, chaired the safeguarding board for the city of Bristol. I've got a big population, uh, I think about 600,000 now, maybe, maybe a bit bigger, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, I did that. So those five areas and Bristol, and also being a, for 14 years a social services director, uh, has led me to reflect on what makes it sensible in terms of being a resilient organisation. And uh, it doesn't take much time to go off the ball. I've seen really good organisations and uh, have a change of leadership, for example. Uh, and the leadership might be in terms of governance, like in England, councillors, or it might be in terms of senior managers. Uh, and uh, yeah, within six months, a really good organisation can just go off the ball and suddenly start falling off the cliff edge. So some thoughts from me about resilient organisations. Culture, capacity and context. All three more C's. Yeah, culture, capacity and context. Culture. Is the organisation hot? And uh, again, if we were together, I'd invite a conversation about where you're working, is it hot? And by hot, I don't mean... Is it overheated? Is it too busy? There may be some of that for most organizations today, to be honest, because of the context we've been talking about. So I'm not talking about is the organization hot in terms of being overheated? What I'm talking about is, is the organization hot in terms of being honest, open, and trusting and trustworthy? Are you working in an organization where you can have conversations within the organization about what life is really like working there, what's going well, but also an honest and open and trusting conversation about where it's not working well. If you're at the front line uh, as a practitioner uh, or a frontline manager, are you able to um, 
relay through the organization, the realities of what it's like, and others will be listening to you and listening to you because they want to understand and they want to learn and they want to be aware, but you're not going to be beaten up because of it. Are you in an organization where across colleagues and working in your work group, you can have honest and open conversations as well and you feel as though you're part of a shared enterprise. So is your organization hot? Is it honest, open and trusting and trustworthy? Trustworthy in the sense of, yeah, you can have the honest and open conversations and you're not gonna be picked off because of it. Is the organization one that you can trust? When things happen, and we work in services, we work in contexts, we have roles where somewhere along the line, something awful is likely to happen. And I couldn't be a social services director for 14 years without children dying within my area that we knew. I couldn't be a social services director in my year, in my area for 14 years without an older person, as has happened, wandering off from an old person's home on a Saturday night and being found the following morning. Uh, in the woods nearby, dead as a consequence of hypothermia. I couldn't be a director of social services for 14 years without someone with uh, 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 mental health difficulties, presenting a threat to others, and indeed in one sense, killing somebody else, uh, their partner, uh, or committing suicide or harming themselves. We work in contexts where Sometimes awful things will happen. And unlike, I have to say, some politicians and some parts of the media, I don't have the means of predicting the future in the perfect way to stop all those awful things from happening. So when something awful happens within your work, within your organization, for you, can you trust the organization to be beside you? Can you trust the organization to be holding on to you? Can you trust the organization to still feel as though, yep, they're there beside you and you're a part of it as a collective enterprise? Or as I, I just say, I fear in some places, the world will implode on top of you and there'll be a lot of blame around and a lot of um, detailed analysis of all the work that you've done, but without actually looking at the context in which you're doing that work. So can you trust the organization to be beside you when something awful happens? Is it an organization which has got grip and focus on what really matters? What really matters in the services that we are a part of? What really matters in the organizations that we're employed within? Is what's happening for children and families disabled adults, including older people, in terms of their daily life experience. What's really important is what contributions we're making within those lives. Sometimes for people in the midst of really intense crisis, sometimes for people whose lives are out of control, sometimes for people who are going under. Grip and focus, it's not about big strategies. It's not about those big performance indicators that get reported. Is the organization focused on, does it have grip and focus on what's really important? What's happening at the front line for children and families who they're working with and for disabled adults and older people? I really hammer this hard because one of my experiences with those five local authority areas, and not just the local authority, the council there in England, but health services, policing, schools, et cetera, as well. Sometimes they've been distracted. They've been distracted by exciting strategic change. They've been excited and distracted by um, uh, really um, uh, interesting corporate agendas. And senior managers have lost sight of what's happening at the front line. They've lost sight of what's happening within the communities. And it becomes a bit of a surprise when the inspectorate comes in and says, it's not going very well here, is it? 
and they think, oh, didn't know that. So one of the things in terms of grip and focus within organizations is having leaders, senior managers, who are really close to what's happening at the front line. And sometimes we can get distracted from that from a whole range of other activities, which might be presented to us as important, but really are not the day job. Praise and celebration more than blame and shame. Is it an organization in terms of culture where it goes out of its way, looks for every opportunity to say, thank you, well done, a difficult piece of work. No, you did that. Thank you. Really impressive. Or is it an organization which is a bit quiet, really? Not much is being said until something awful happens. And then, whoops, what happens then? is it all seems to pile in. The organizations which have the most stable workforces are the organizations where people want to work. And I'd rather work in an organization where I'm respected and recognized for what I'm achieving rather than waiting for something awful to happen and then there's a good kicking coming along. Is it an organization? Because we're all working in really busy sometimes frenetic context, which actually can calm things down, slow it down a little bit, rather than getting a bit um, hyperactive and a bit manic in terms of what it feels like working here. That's not just about workload, it's about style, it's about experience, it's about um, people, it's about some people are able to calm it down, even when it's really busy, and other people don't get to flare up and run all over the place. We want organizations which contain stress rather than contaminate us all with stress. Culture, important capacity. It really is difficult to do the job, and it's difficult to perform well as an organization if you don't have the capacity to do what you're being required to do. And if you're a frontline manager, or any manager or a practitioner, if it feels like that, it's hard to be able to do what we need to be able to do. And it's got difficult, really difficult over the last 12 years as a consequence of year on year on year cumulative cuts. But again, and I don't want to min minimize this at all, some organizations manage to uh, contain it and survive it a bit better than others. But at the end of the day, there's no doubt at all, we don't have the tools to do the job, time, we can't do the job we need to do. Stability and continuity. Goes back to one of those C's earlier in the eight C's. If we have a workforce with a load of churn and change, comings and goings, where um, yes, we may have some experienced workers, but the balance is increasingly towards people who are short-term appointments or people who are relatively uh, less experienced as we all were at some point in time. If we don't have that stability and continuity building up a workforce, which has increasing experience and expertise and competence and confidence, experience and expertise, competence and confidence, it's not a given. You have to work on that within organizations to uh, both create it and to hold on to it. If we don't have that in terms of capacity, a workforce which is stable and has got continuity, doesn't mean it's static. Yes, there'll be some coming and goings, and you want that in terms of um, sometimes some life and uh, new thinking injected into the organization coming in. But I don't, you want it on a platform of stability and continuity, which increasingly creates experience with expertise and competence and confidence within the workforce and the services we're providing. Systems for practice rather than practice for systems. And that's me, I have to say. And as you all have seen earlier, in terms of even trying to change the screen, uh, I am no IT wizard, uh, and uh, uh, I get incredibly frustrated just on my own laptop, even my own mobile phone. Uh, in terms of, it probably can do what it needs to do, but I can't work it, make it do it. Uh, and so often I fear that our experience today is that um, uh, we have systems around us which don't quite do what they need to do. And I've never got to that position, and I don't know any organisation which has quite got to that position. But if we're stranded with that, it's really difficult to do the job we need to do. And this bit about resilient organizations is not just about 
the organization where you're working, the organization where, where I'm working. It's about our partners as well. We cannot do the job we need to do in a good way if we have a lot of uh, difficulties in terms of our partner organizations aren't able to contribute in the way they need to contribute. Health services, if you're working in children's social care, even within the integrated health and social care trust, schools, policing services. I'm just thinking in terms of Northern Ireland and uh, all the range of community services because you have a rich voluntary and community sector in Northern Ireland. You really do. Uh, it's a bit fragmented, it seems to me, in terms of a bit patchy, uh, but it's, it's rich. Uh, how we work across all those organisations within the public and statutory sectors and the voluntary and community sectors, we need all those organisations to be working well. Otherwise, there's a weakness there which um, pulls us all down somewhat. Resilient teams. I'm assuming that by most of the colleagues who are uh, uh, here today, uh, I've got a background in social work and working in social care services, and maybe primarily for children, but some for adults as well. One of our big traditions in social work is working in teams. It's really important for a number of reasons, which I'll go into at a moment, but it's not necessarily a tradition for some other professions. And if you're a community nurse out there, health visitor, GP, if you're uh, in the past a police officer, uh, there's a beat police officer. Uh, if you're a lawyer, you don't necessarily see yourself as working in a team. You see yourself as an individual, if you like, worker, professional, out there getting on with what you get on with. Same in the past for teachers in schools, somewhat different now. Maybe somewhat different from the police now in terms of community policing teams, etc. But um, teams are really important in our tradition of social work and social care, and for good reasons. And if we were together again, I would be saying to all of us, will the frontline managers stand up? And what I'd then be saying, in the midst of senior managers and others, the frontline managers who are now standing up are the most important people in the organization. And the reason I would be saying that is that if you're a frontline manager, you're the most important person in your organization for two reasons. One is you have a major, maybe the biggest impact on the experience of the colleagues you are working with within your team, within your service, within your unit, in terms of coming to work each day. You create that microculture within your organization, which determines the experience of working within that organization day by day from the colleagues around you. The second reason you're the most important person in your organization is you actually impact on and quality control practice more than anybody else. You are there beside practitioners day by day, supporting them in their practice, sometimes um, helping them to reflect within their practice, sometimes challenging them in their practice. So you actually probably have a stronger quality control function in terms of practice than anybody else in the organization day by day. You also have a major part in creating that team culture, what it feels like working in that team, being together or being fragmented. And you don't do that on your own, you do that by engaging with your colleagues in your team, in your work group, in your service center, but team culture varies tremendously from team to team and place to place. And it wouldn't be difficult, I think, for us to pause at some stage and just say, what type of teams have you worked in which have been really good? And what type of teams have you worked in? You're quite glad you're not there now. And a part of that team culture is that to what extent teams are able to create their own stability and balance in terms of experience and uh, newness of workers. Uh, because the teams that have got a really good team culture, led by a really good frontline manager, tend to be more stable. It's not a given, but it tends to be so. And what also helps teams, I think, in terms of being really uh, well-performing teams where you want to work, good places to be, is that they have a bit of space and control to take some ownership, do some shaping for themselves collectively about what they're doing, not just 
and being dictated to within their organization, but actually can have some space and control to do what they need to do and seeing the way to do it, having some um, opportunity to shape that for themselves. Resilient teams, again, is a part of our tradition within social work, sometimes uh, maybe a little bit mythical in some places, but reflective supervision. Going back to that conversation earlier about emotional intelligence and intellectual intelligence, and uh, we do work which is distressing and personally challenging, sometimes personally threatening. And we do work which is complicated and we need to make some sense of what's going on. And that traditional reflective supervision and support and within teams from our supervisors, our managers, and sometimes across from colleagues as well, really important. Don't necessarily get it in some other professions. We need to hold on to it within social work and social care. And the resilient teams get the job done. And they stay in control. It's a bit earlier about um, some teams can contain stress and some teams just run out of control very quickly. And you see the difference even within uh, uh, one area or one office sometimes. Resilient workers, you and me. It's my last pitch now, at about um, getting towards 10 past one. So I'm about to stop talking. So be prepared to fill some space, okay. <laughs> uh, but um, resilient workers, you and me. What makes a resilient worker? And we know this from some of the research has been undertaken recently and over the years, as well as from our personal experience. Resilient workers feel that they're valued and they are valued. It's a bit about working in an organization which um, prioritizes uh, praise and celebration over blame. Feeling valued for what you're doing and getting recognition for it. And valuing yourself in that as well in terms of a little bit further down on that uh, slide, self and professional esteem. Recognizing for yourself the value of the work that you're doing, the contribution you're making, the difference that you are uh, uh, helping to push forward in people's lives. And being within a, a shared enterprise where you don't feel out there on your own, exposed, isolated, lonely, vulnerable. Being part of a shared enterprise where you've got colleagues around you within that work group, within that organization, who you value and you value them and they know that they're valued by you, being valued and feeling valued, but also where you can trust them uh, and where when the going gets tough, you're able to be open about it and sometimes able to offload about, hey, I'm going under here or sometimes, yeah, I'm going on a visit and I'm really quite scared about it. I'm quite frightened about it. This is a threatening person. Having those conversations and sometimes hopefully getting the response of let's do this sort of two up this time rather than just say, you're out there on your own. But able to be open about uh, how it is for you at that point in time. Helps me to be resilient, keep going, and hopefully you as well. Resilient workers are people who, and uh, I recognize I'm saying this in the context of NI. SCC, uh, in terms of conti continuing professional development, having confidence, but allowed, being allowed to, and taking the opportunity to enrich that confidence as we go forward, seeing ourselves as progressing in terms of the work that we do, and having some control and autonomy, albeit within a, a framework of policies and procedures, to be able to um, undertake some of the work we're doing rather than feeling that we're just task focused on meeting the requirements set for us by others. And when it gets really difficult, really hard to do, both putting a hand up to that, but also really hard to do, then giving colleagues a little bit of space to um, not have a breather, but just to regain some of that, that point in time they're losing as they go under. And not feeling lonely and isolated when you get into that position. And then some personal mechanisms for coping. You've got yours, I've got mine, here they come. I have got a metaphorical box beside me. It's a really high, uh, heavy metal box, probably lead or something really heavy. It's got a really big heavy lid on it as well. It's there, I can see it now. It's metaphorical though. And when I really have got something that I'm worried about and it's spinning around in my head and I can't quite close it down. One of the things I try to do is stick it in the box. 
It's gone in the box. It's there. I've slammed the lid down on it. I've not lost it. It's there. I can pick it up, take the lid off, get it out again when I need to. But at the moment, it's in the box. Stop thinking about it. If I'm somewhere where I'm anxious, where I feel a bit threatened, where I'm not sure I know what's going on, I metaphorically move my left hand down. I can feel myself doing it now. I change down through the gears it's before you had automated vehicles. So I was going down from fourth to third to second to first. I'm slowing it all down. Greater, greater awareness of what's going on around me. I'm going down through the gears. I'm slowing it down. Where sometimes when the adrenaline starts to flow and you feel under threat or anxious, it all speeds up. But that's the time you need to slow it down. You probably have. I certainly have got a notepad by the bed. If I wake up at three o'clock in the morning thinking about something, scribble a note. I can't even read the handwriting usually in the morning about what I scribbled. Uh, it's only two words, but I can stop thinking about it then because I know, okay, the note will remind me in the morning. I'll think about it again then. Long rhythmic walks really help me. I just clear the head by going out for a really long walk. Rhythm, rhythm, pace, pace, step, step, thinking it through gradually, unwinding from it. And have you got a to-do list? And when you've done the list, do you throw it out? Well, I don't. <laughs> I have got pages and pages of to-do lists. They're really important to me, not because there's loads, loads still to do on them. They've got yeah, things still to do on them, but not loads to do on them. The reason I keep them is that I've ticked off the ones I've done. And I can look back from time to time and think, oh, gosh, uh, yeah, because I've got these things. So, hey, but look what I've done. Look what I've cleared off the to-do list. So my to-do list is not just a to-do list, it's a done list as well. And I do find that really quite helpful sometimes. Hey, and these are all little minor things, aren't they? And you will have your own ways of coping. But these are things that hey, I'm putting my hand up to that, that I use. Resilient workers, having personal mechanisms for coping. And a big message from all of this is that we can help us each other to be resilient. That's a bit about being in teams, being supervisors, being colleagues, being beside each other. Uh, it helps to build resilience as well. So we talked about the current context. I've made a pitch on HCs, which I think are really important in social work and social care services, working in children and adults. And I've shared some reflections on resilience. So that's it my, for me in terms of talking, uh, but I would be interested to, if it's okay with you, we've got about 15, 20 minutes to open up a bit. I'm really keen to get comments as much as questions, because I want to be understanding the views of others as well as just, if you like, parting on about my views. Thank you so much, Ray. That has been um, a really insightful journey, I think, for all of us across social work in, in our recent career histories for, for a few of us anyway around the screen who, who've been around for a while. And I think just that focus around the organisation, the team and, and ourselves um, has been really important. I'll go back to um, one comment that Colin McCafferty from the, the Southern Trust um, talks about where, where Colin is saying, you know, hugely important messages which all components of the service need to reflect upon, including policymakers commissioners and those of us with both strategic and operational responsibilities and that it goes well beyond uh, social services and uh, I'll invite Colin maybe to, to come in on that comment if you if you want to call him. Okay, Marion and Ray hopefully it's fairly self-explanatory and you know for those of us who've been around for a long long time it's refreshing in many ways just to be reminded of those key messages well, maybe a little bit frustrating, but you know, we know this, we've talked about it time and time again, but as a collective, we've struggled to maintain focus on those key messages. We've all come into social work in terms of trying to, you know, do right by vulnerable families, communities, and particularly children in our world. And we know the importance of continuity of relationships, consistency, trust and trustworthiness. But as a system, we have absolutely struggled, particularly in the last 10 odd years, 
to maintain that consistency in parts of our service. Now, I qualify that. Some parts of our service, we have been good at it, but we haven't reflected enough and asked enough searching questions as to why we have not been able to maintain that type of stability to be able to deliver on all of those issues. So that's really refreshing, Ray, to hear such key messages um, being unearthed again at this really critical, important juncture with regards to reviewing how we um, deliver our services. So thank you for that. Thanks, Colin. Um, Ray, unless you want to, to come back in on that, I've, I've got a number of other comments that I'll, I'll share with you as well. And uh, Marion, do you want to ask people to use the kind of hand function if they want to uh, speak? Just yes. Use a hand function or whatever. Please do. Um, you know, if you if you put up your hand, we'll we'll keep an eye and and bring people in. Um, a couple of people on the comments. Brenda talked about you know the importance of building competence and confidence through through our CPD, and I suppose referencing just how how fortunate we are indeed in Northern Ireland. And I know Ray, you've commented on this with our our PIP framework, our professional and practice framework, which hopefully supports. The, um, the ongoing development uh, of our social work staff. Um, Suzanne uh, came in as a practice teacher, um, giving the comment that it's, it's great to have the chance to be supportive of good practice and, and hear from service users about what matters. And Dawn Shaw from, from Nigala then came in to, to talk about, um, you know, that, that she's seeing this as, as a great blueprint for excellent social work practice, reminding us of our our journey and also um, you know what is core to us as social workers and thinking about that within the wider uh, system and uh, particularly in terms of that community uh, that community context and the importance of the voluntary sector. So I'm happy to take. If anyone is raising hands, I don't see any hands at the moment. Um, whether you want to come back on any of those comments, Ray. And if you want me to reflect, and uh, I've been out now over the last five months across Northern Ireland. Uh, I've met, I keep saying, over 400, 450 um, colleagues working within primarily in children's services, but I'm now beginning to um, roll out into adult services as well, mental health um, tomorrow, I think, for a start. And uh, uh, so I've seen quite a lot of, of colleagues. I've met with an increasing number of young people. Uh, I'm beginning to meet with uh, parents collectively as well as individually. Uh, and the picture I've got in terms of an embryonic picture, and um, I keep saying to colleagues when, I, when I'm meeting with them, you could write the report now probably, I could put it in the bottom drawer and pull it out June next year, and um, uh, it would be pretty accurate because and you've all got wisdom and expertise and experience and know what's going on. Uh, and my view is that um, we have a heck of a lot of commitment. We have a tremendous amount of competence, and we have some really strong experience in Northern Ireland, you know how to do the job and how to do it well. And nothing that I've been saying uh, earlier in this session would I be saying as something which I think is a surprise and shock to you because and you know the business, you know the service, you know how to do it. But I'm a bit taxed at the moment. I'm a bit taxed by the churn and change, change that we've got. I'm a bit taxed that we've not got the stability in the workforce that we needed. I'm thinking hard about um, the Health and Social Care Trust and uh, uh, the pressures they're under, particularly in relation to health and hospitals and, uh, and what that then means for, for children's services, but maybe for adult social services as well. Uh, and I think we're in a position where we know what we need to do. Uh, and getting back to that grip and focus bit and hearing what Colin was saying as well about, you know, it's not just an issue for practitioners and op operational managers. It's you know, right across the board for policymakers and everybody else and politicians. We know what we need to do, but we have to reset, I think, to some extent, and uh, where we're at in terms of being able to do it. Uh, and, you know, one of my tasks in terms of making a contribution when I'm here 
because the other thing I've been heard to say quite often is you don't need another review. You do not need another review. You don't need another report. You have loads of them. I could spend all my time doing this review, just reading all the previous reviews. Waste of time. Well, it was not a waste of time. I'd be very informative, but then it wouldn't help me to see a way forward necessarily, because uh, the big question is why are we not taking the action we need to take off all these other reviews and recommendations. So, and what I'm hoping I can do while I'm here between uh, last February and next June or next year is make a difference while I'm here alongside you, taking my cue from you to some extent. Uh, and one of the big things I think we have to do is how do we actually get that continuity back within the workforce, which isn't there in the way we need it at the moment. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, just checking across the screen if there are any more comments or um, questions, please do put your hands up. There's not, Marion. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, I think, Ray, um, I suppose, firstly, I want to thank you so much for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, we your your ongoing work on the review of children's services um i think is giving all of us the opportunity to get engaged in that conversation about what do we do and i think some of your comments back to us this afternoon ha have been very helpful in terms of reflecting back you know giving us a sense of where we are at and it's always helpful to have that that external perspective particularly when you come to us with such a, a wide range of um experience from other places um the, the, the presentation, as Alison said um, at the outset, we have recorded this session and we will um, hopefully have a, a copy of your, your, your presentation and we will make it available on our website um, when, when we do some, some work around that to get it up there. Um, I want to thank the over 50 people who have joined us this, this lunchtime. Um, it's always great to see that so many people will take up you know space within the middle of their day when probably they should be eating their lunch and and the, getting ready for the the raft of, of meetings uh, for the afternoon so we we really do appreciate that but on behalf of of everybody around the screen red um i really do want to thank you so much for your your time your knowledge and insight and your ideas um uh, uh, back to us in terms of of what we can be doing. I particularly um, thank you for your personal tips around um, how you cope. Um, I think that, that that's really helpful to see um, how how someone in your position you know just looks for those coping mechanisms the same as we all do. Thank you so much, Ray. Thank you everyone around okay. for joining us, and um, see you all again soon. Take good care.